Today is episode number five, and we will be talking today about who will make it in the rapture. I know that the rapture is a word, many people don't like the word rapture. Um, They say, critics will say that the rapture is not in the Bible. And in actuality, the word rapture, which is not a English, it's an English translation, but it's from a Latin word that was derived from the Greek. And it means the catching away. And in that catching away, Jesus spoke about this multiple times. And he's given us some clear indications of that there will be a shocking um, revelation of who was really a disciple of Jesus Christ. According to several of the stories, we're going to be shocked. I'm going to focus on one of those today, um, but I want to make sure that we understand that the Bible is full of good news. There is a gospel that Jesus has given, and that gospel is that we don't have to fear our eternal our eternal life. We have, if we believe in Jesus Christ and have asked for forgiveness of our sins, have eternal life and heaven waiting for us. And our, our hearts, as we live this life right now on this earth, should be fixed and centered on the life to come, that we should be living currently, right now, knowing and preparing for the day that is to come. And so I wanted to begin with um, a quote that Martin Luther had given. And, you know, Martin Luther, when he had nailed his thesis to the church that day, did not realize the impact it was going to have around the world for a reformation. Um, But this was his own personal journey. And each one of us has a personal journey that we're on. And we have to be at all points ready to make that impact on those around us, not just our own life, but the lives of those around us for the purpose that God has chosen for us, pointing toward him, advancing the kingdom. And Martin Luther said this, I expect three surprises when I get to heaven. First, there will be people in heaven he did not expect to be there. Second, there will be people not present in heaven that he was certain would be there. And third, which is the greatest surprise of all, that he is there himself. Um, In um, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, it says, Therefore, Do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. You know, heaven is not a place that we can just go to without making preparation to go there. There are a lot of gospels being spoken today. There's a lot of different gospels and and Jesus's being preached, depending on who you're listening to. Um, Even in the secular realm, the idea that it doesn't matter who you believe in or what you believe, And yet somehow in these belief systems, they all want to go to heaven. (laughs) I find that quite interesting that they want to take an element that is spoken about in scripture, something that there is a truth there that down in the depths of who they are, they recognize that this life doesn't end here. We don't die and just go away. Our spirit lives on forever and we will at some point according to 1 Corinthians, be changed in the twinkling of an eye, that we will be made then in the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ, given a new heavenly body. And some of us rejoice over that. The older we get, the more we're excited about that new body. But that is our our hope and our desire, knowing that there is something more than what we are living in here, Um, especially if we have dealt with hardship and trouble and have come through trauma and and all kinds of circumstances in our lives that we're looking for this great delivery. 
Well, the gospel, the good news of Jesus is that you can be delivered here on earth and receive salvation, but there's more than what's here. For the person and the soul that is longing for more, there is more, and it is found in seeking and becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ to live as he lived. He lived as an overcomer of everything. He came as the answer. And we can be that same answer to those around us. We can have the answers to this world's problems if we've got Jesus. And so I want to turn your attention. Today, you're going to want, I'm giving you a lot of scripture today. You're going to want to get your Bible out and get a pen and paper and jot these down. You may want to be even um, one of the most uh, adventurous ones and to study even further and take it further. I'll make mention of things, but you might want to study those things on your own. But if we're going to start, I want to start with the story of Jesus speaking. You know, when we think about scripture, so many people, even those who concentrate on only the words of Jesus, if you were to read just the words of Jesus, you would recognize that there are, he said many weighty things and that there is a time coming when great tribulation will come on this earth. And to those of us who are watching and looking for his return, we realize and recognize he's coming very soon. And for those of us who have recognized that, we understand that it is a wake up call for us, that we must be busy and be about our father's business, that there are things that need to be accomplished and finished and done, and that we ourselves are to be prepared for his coming, for his appearing. And that if we are not prepared, how then can I make others prepared? How then can I share the gospel with someone else? How then can I care what Jesus cares about and win souls for Christ? The um, indictment that we're going to read today is an indictment because it is being spoken to true disciples, those who are already are already serving and following the Lord. And yet Jesus has a warning for them, a warning for us. If you call yourself by the name Christian, we have to be ready to listen to what Jesus had to say. And this is what it says in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward, came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. There are several similarities we need to point out um, in this story so that you can understand the warning that Jesus is giving. He's the one saying, watch, therefore. He's the one giving a heart of concern to those who are his disciples. All of these virgins were in the same group. They had the same qualifications, let's say. 
as being a virgin. They were all virgins. They all had lamps. They all had the same equipment. They, they, there was not one who had more than the other. They were equally given as far as equipment is concerned. They all had um, a time when they all fell asleep that there was, they were all sleeping. And I, I really think that even right now in the church world, um, up until um, this latest worldwide crisis of health, um, and, and until that came to the forefront, the church was basically asleep. All, all slept. And yet there came a cry at midnight. There came a cry in the trouble, and it began to wake people up. And according to this scripture and this passage of scriptures, they all woke up. They all had the same, heard the same cry. They, they all heard the same thing. They were all given the same information. They all had the same knowledge. The bridegroom is coming. And so they're going. They, they know he's coming. They've gone to this place that they're waiting for him. And what's interesting is it says that he tarried, um, knowing that Jesus that he explained that the bridegroom tarried, and he's referring to himself for, for when he will come again. But that tarrying is that time when we think he should have come by now. It's been longer than we expected. And for many who have grown up in the church, they have fallen asleep for this very reason, for the same reason, that they, their spirits have fallen asleep because they've heard forever that Jesus is coming back. And yet here they are, and it's now 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road. And you you really aren't even hearing people say it much anymore because, well, he just hasn't come yet. So we get sleepy. We don't want to keep repeating the same thing over and over again, because the people who, who criticize will say, well, he would have come by now. And you, you're, just, you're hoping on something that's never going to happen. And, and they attack faith because faith says that if the word says it, it's true. And, and those who are Christians have gotten weak in their ability to stand and guard their faith or to stand and be ready to, um, to protect the faith, so to speak, to, to, to be one that would, would not just guard it, but somebody who would defend it. We, we are defenders of the faith. And if you're going to defend the faith, you have to know what it is you're defending. I find this fascinating because in this story, heaven, planning to go to heaven, Jesus is literally talking about coming back and he's going to take with him those and shut the door. And those who are ready will make it. Those who are not ready will not make it. How do I make sure I'm in the, the group that makes it? And what is heaven after all? And am I really thinking that I'm going to make it to heaven without preparing to go there? I mean, in your natural state, if you're planning a vacation just a, for one week, even if you were going just for a couple days, you take it takes preparation. You've got to pack your things. You've got to think about tomorrow to know what will I need tomorrow and able to do what I'm going to do. If you're someone who's going on a fishing adventure, you're going to have to make sure and get all your equipment together. You're going to think about the bait that you're going to need. You know, you're going to have to prepare the vessel that you're going to be using to get there. Do you have enough gas? You've got so many things to prepare and think about, depending on what de destination, if, even if you were going on a cruise and you feel like everything is provided for you, you still have to pack your belongings. You may have to take a plane to get to the place where the ship is going to leave from or come back from. There are, there are so many things that have to be thought out just to go away for a small little trip. What about your eternity? What preparation are you making for your eternal soul? If you have made no preparation, I can guarantee you, you're not going anywhere. You're not going there. To go to heaven takes preparation. And how will you even know what you need to do to prepare if you have not spent time with the Lord and spent time in his word? It is by his word that we know that there is a heaven. It is by his word that we know we can be saved and go to that heaven. It is by his word that we know how to get to heaven. We've got to be true disciples in these last days. Jesus is coming back and he is coming back very soon. And we've got to be ready when that call comes. 
you know, other, other portions of scripture, and I'm not going to go into those today, will say that he comes as a thief in the night. I think that's why this, this particular passage says that the call came at midnight. He says, we don't know the day or the hour. We don't know when he's going to come. And because we don't know when he's going to come, it will come as a surprise. So if we have not already prepared, we can't prepare then. It will be too late. When the call comes, we must be ready. It, it's like a mother who's going to give birth to her child. She has a bag already packed and ready to go. The hospital already has paperwork filed on her, knowing that at any moment they can get the call and she's on her way in. Preparations are made. A room has already been made for that child. We live our lives understanding this principle that we must be ready. And if we do not take the same severity of heart and the same excitement for what's to come, that it is more than these few years we have with trouble here on this earth, that there is a home waiting for us where there is no tears, there is no sickness, there is no death or disease, there is no trouble or heartache, there, there is no place where someone is betraying and causing you harm. We're, we're going to a place that we all long to be, but we've got to prepare to be there. I'm going to look back at some of these things and take them kind of one by one for us. But all these virgins went forth, meaning they heard the call to follow Christ. So they are preparing, knowing that Jesus is coming. A bridegroom is coming. So they were all so-called Christians. And you wouldn't know which ones are going from which ones won't go based off of how they look. Um, I think it's interesting. Um, R.T. Kendall, um, who is an author, had wrote this definition, written this definition of what the gospel is. He says, the gospel is the good news that you will go to heaven when you die and not hell. By transferring your trust that is in your good works to what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did for you on the cross. So they have taken this same position as Christians, that they know there is a heaven and they're going to gain heaven and they're not going to hell. This is what they believe. But instead of maybe transferring all of their attention from the things that they do, thinking that somehow in the back of their mind they are still earning that salvation, or those who have decided that because of grace they can now use grace as a tool to continue to live the way they were living and never gain freedom from their old man and put their trust instead in Jesus Christ to be transforming them now and preparing them now for what is to come. They all had lamps. The Bible teaches us that the, it, the, his word, the Bible, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. They all had that available to them. They all had a lamp. They all had the word. They had the word. But what it takes to keep that lamp going is oil. The oil represented that continual burning, the continual living of the fire. Um, there's a passage of scripture, I believe it's in Proverbs, that says that the soul of the man or the spirit of the man is um, the candle of the Lord. And you'll see even in the Jewish culture when those are praying at the wailing wall and, and the people are standing and they're making this position of bowing forward, back and forth, rocking back and forth. They are emulating that they are the candle of the Lord, the light. If you've ever seen a candle and you slightly blow or let air hit that candle, it flickers. And we are su supposed to be moved by the breath of God, that flicker of God upon us, his word moving on us. And we move according to that pressure, that breath, that air, that spirit of God. And that's what takes us and moves us forward. Well, if I'm not moved by that, if I have no oil, how can I move according to his word? My light will go out without continual oil. 
all had the same knowledge. The bridegroom is coming. He's coming. We know he's coming. If, if you talk to a Christian who truly says they believe the word of God from cover to cover, not picking pieces out and making their own doctrine, not creating a new Jesus and an image that matches the culture, but picking what the word says. If, if you have a Christian who calls themselves by the name of Jesus Christ, who believes what the Bible says, they have the same knowledge that Jesus is coming back. But if he's coming back, are we living a life that truly believes he's coming back? I mean, we have the knowledge. According to this passage of scripture, there were those who they all said they believed it, but their actions showed differently. We must be those who cannot be deceived in this last hour. Because of all of the chaos and all of the clamoring of all the voices fighting and arguing right now, the stress that everyone is under by just simply watching a news channel, we can be so bombarded by outside circumstances and outside voices that we have not, we're not even sure what we're hearing on the inside. And it is possible to be deceived. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 4, take Heed. I mean, he's giving a warning. You've got to pay attention to this as my disciples. Take heed that no man deceives you. Well, the only way not to be deceived is to, for yourself, remain in his word. You've got to know what the word says. You've got to be able to, to read what Jesus said to know, is this truth or is this not truth? All truth is not because of what you hear on, on the radio or on television. Uh, you, you can hear everyone saying, I'm telling you the truth. This is the truth. Or you hear these days everything is, is it facts or is it false? That's not true. We have fact checkers everywhere you look. We have self-appointed check, fact, uh, fact checkers. And all of these things are meant to um, gain your trust that they themselves are telling you the truth. We have a fight going on between what we say is truth and what we say is science. And that now science is now a fluid thing where it used to be a concrete thing. That we've taken every foundation that there is to stand on and we have shaken, he, has, he said in these last days that everything would be shaken. And it is. Everything that you would stand on that you think is firm is being shaken. The only firm foundation we have to build on and know what the truth is, is the word of God. You've got to know what the word says so that you won't be deceived, no matter what you hear or from whom that you hear it. We, Jesus gave another warning that we had to be careful because even the very elect could be deceived. Even those that you think could never be deceived. That's why I think that quote from uh, Martin Luther is so apropos for today. Uh, he's going to be shocked at who's there and shocked who he thought would be and isn't there. There are ministers, not just lay people, but ministers who once walked in the fire and the, the oil of God with their light burning bright who no longer do. We've got to be diligent. We have to be people who look after our own souls. Don't leave it to somebody else. Don't leave your preparation to someone else. In fact, we'll read that that's not possible. According to scripture, it's just not possible. In fact, you know, with our children, we put so much emphasis on our kids going to college. This, is, this came up when I was um, just uh, probably in my mid-20s. Uh, everywhere we turned, we heard everyone needs to go to college. I even for a while started to believe this. That every, we should go to college. Everyone needs to go to college. You can't get a good job without a college education. The problem with that is that when you go to a secular place, even a place that calls itself by a Christian name or organization, we have left our knowledge to what others tell us that says. If I'm someone who goes to church and I let that pastor read that passage of scripture to me, and I take it as, that, as face value what he said is truth, but I never go read that for myself. I am someone who is subject to being easily deceived. 
I have the equipment available to me. There will be no excuse for me standing in front of the Lord when he says, no, you had your own Bible. Why didn't you read what it said? It won't do any good to say, well, I listened to what the pastor said that you said. We are responsible ourselves. We should be constantly reading, constantly searching, and constantly teaching our children to be watchful. All of them fell asleep. So I don't want us to fall into this condemnation that I have fallen asleep. Today, he says, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. So today, if you're listening to this broadcast, whenever you're hearing it, if you're hearing his voice, it's not too late. Today is the day of salvation. Today, not tomorrow, today. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. We don't know if the call will come at midnight. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. We've got to be ready now. But now is the time. In fact, we read that now is the day of salvation. Even faith. He says now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, right now is, is when we have faith. Right now is when we make those changes. So even if we've fallen asleep, we aren't staying asleep. We get up. We get up. The only difference between these two groups of people who call themselves by the same name, who have the same equipment, who have the same knowledge, who had the same weakness in falling asleep because of, of the waiting and the tarrying, the only difference between them was that five had oil, five didn't have oil. Jesus very clearly says that the five without oil were foolish. And the five who had oil were wise. To be wise, meaning that you have oil, you have continual oil because it was necessary for continuous light. It is a perpetual state. It is that act of preparation. They didn't know the day. They didn't know the hour that the bridegroom was coming. And because they didn't know, they knew they had to prepare ahead of time to have what they would need till the very end. They themselves had thought this process through. They had looked through tomorrow. What do I need to do today that I'm ready tomorrow? And for them, that preparation was the oil. The oil that can mean so many things in scripture. Here it was the thing that kept their fire burning. It kept the light bright. Having the light meant they would not be left in darkness. Having light meant that they could shine a light to others who are in darkness. Having light meant that they knew the path they would take when they heard him call their name. Having the oil was necessary. Those who were foolish carried no additional oil. In fact, that scripture said that they said to the wise, give us your oil because our lamps have gone out. In their sleeping, the difference of not having the oil meant that their light that they did have went out. We could have burned brightly once and are not burning that same brightness today. We have got to be people who are careful about keeping our light burning. You want to be a, someone who is a blaze for God. I, I don't know who said this. I would give credit to them. I don't know where this uh, phrase was coined. But someone once said that I want to be a fire, set on fire for God so that all of those will turn and see and watch me burn. We want to be those who are so on fire for God that others will turn and look at us and watch us burn for Christ, wanting to have that same fire, wanting to have that same oil of preparation burning in them. Jesus is coming back. Most Christians believe this. Uh, there, I, I, you know, there are so many new doctrines out right now. I, I just, it's hard to keep up with so many that are making up their own doctrines. But for the majority of us who call ourselves Christians, we do believe Jesus is coming back. We, in this day and age, in this era we live, in this culture we're in, have the same knowledge. We have the same equipment. 
but Jesus has delayed in his coming. And dare I say that we've all fallen asleep until recently. Many have heard the herald of the bridegroom that he's coming. And just as the foolish came late saying, Lord, Lord, they were told, I don't know you. It reminded me of another passage of scripture that Jesus said, and it's found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. And it says this, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name have we not done wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. What is he saying? He's saying there are those who call themselves Christians who do things in the name of Christ. But if they're still workers of iniquity and they have not cleansed themselves and made themselves ready, they will come to him in that day at that marriage and the door will be shut. When that door closes, there is no do over. There is no. This was what happened with the 10 virgins. They said to the wise, give us your oil. And they told them, we can't give you our oil. Oil is produced by self-purchase. It is not um, attained. But I can't eat for you. You could be hungry. I can't go into the kitchen and eat for you and you be nourished and you be fed. I can't drink for you. I can't go get a college education for you if that's what you're supposed to go do. I can't go into the ministry for you. I can't do those things for you. Those are personally sacrificed and purchased in order to attain. Those are, those are acts that have to be done individually. I must eat for myself. I must feed myself. If I am a grown person, now, of course, if I'm a baby, we understand that there are those who have just come to Christ and we're feeding them. We're feeding them constantly. If you want to be a good parent, you're going to feed that child every couple hours. They need to be fed. And if you're a baby Christian, you need to be eating every couple hours. And someone needs to be making sure you've got the right equipment in your hands, that you have your equipment and that you're being taught. But we have to be very careful to be feeding all the time on the word of God and what he has to say in order for us to grow. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. If you have new life, you want new life, you crave new life, you've got to be feeding on the bread of life. Eat continually. If you are someone who in the natural is sick, you lose your appetite. You, you don't want to eat. It's a sign of sickness. It's the same, it works the exact same way in our Christian life, in our spiritual walk. If you're not hungry, you're sick. Something's wrong. And yet the same is true that for those who eat, they tend to be hungry to eat again. And we just continually have that hunger come on us and we need to eat again. Even a baby, they're hungry all the time. It's healthy for a baby to be hungry all the time. It's, it's healthy for us that if I eat, in the natural, that my body begins processing that food, using it for energy, using it to get things done, using it for motivation. And then I recognize that it starts to wane and I need to eat again. I need to produce more. So I eat again. We must be those who are careful about this spiritual man we carry around. We are responsible for this temple and we must feed and guard the spirit of our, our inner man has got to be protected and we must feed him so that he is nourished and strong and able to withstand whatever lies and whatever trials and whatever circumstances come our way that we are able to stand on firm ground, the firm foundation of the word of God to know that we will be those who are ready. How do we ensure that we are the wise and not the foolish? How do we keep our lights burning how do we bring in our vessels to ensure that we are ready whenever he comes? Because we must be ready. 
The answer is found in the word remain. Having enough oil, continuous oil, is the same picture as something that remains. It doesn't run out. Um, we, we like to use the word remain um, in the past couple of passages that I'm going to be reading, or it could also mean um, to abide, to live in that place, to be continually living in that place. It's, it's like a marriage that you don't live with that person only for a day. You don't even live with them maybe once a week. You continually abide together. You now live together. That union of our spirit with the heavenly father, with the accept, how, how we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and savior and having him dwell in us. He's living with us, living in us. He made us the promise that I never will leave you. I will never forsake you. So we can know that he is not leaving. He's not coming in and going out and, and only coming sometimes. But we, however, have that same, in a union, you have two people committing to one another. Christ never breaks his covenant with us, but we must be careful that we are not breaking that covenant, that we are keeping that continual covenant and that we are remaining with him. We remain in his way. We remain in the spirit of uh, and the knowledge of who he is. We remain in what he teaches. We remain in how he does it, how he instructs us. We remain in obedience to his word. We remain in our state of continual preparation. If, if I was going, if I was um, engaged and about to be married, I think about, um, and I've got family members right now who are engaged and going to be married, and all the preparation that it takes just for that one day, all the preparation that has to be done for the day, for the food, for a reception, for what to wear, for what everybody's going to wear, um, where they might go after the honeymoon. And yet our priority should not just be in preparing for that day, but preparing for that lifetime of marriage, preparing for the long haul, preparing for the day when we will have children and then have grandchildren preparing for the day that I will get to then pass this good news into the hearts of my children and watch them pass it from generation to generation, leaving that legacy and heritage to my children, should the Lord tarry. We always say that, should the Lord tarry. Should he not come back yet? He could, back, could, could come back any moment. He could come back before this broadcast is over. We don't delay in our preparation. We make preparation knowing that there is something still ahead of us. And it is so important that we don't turn loose of it. We remain in it. We stay in that continual state. The foolish in this story have several things that we've got to be careful of that, that we do not do. That, that we would are able to recognize what is foolish behavior. If I can understand what wise behavior is and what foolish behavior is, then I'm able to make a wise decision and not fall into a foolish trap. But, and this is our prevalent, it's a prevalent uh, thing we see in our society right now, but the foolish always expect others to do it for them. These who had no oil expected those who had oil to give them their oil. They had no expectation for themselves. There was no thought put into, well, what if this takes longer than I thought? Was I only in it for the moment? Did I only receive Christ because at that moment I was nervous I was going to get caught in something I did? And so I said a prayer and asked Jesus to forgive me, hoping I wouldn't get caught. But I made no preparation to walk as a Christian from the moment I got up from that altar. From the moment I said that prayer, did I make no preparation? Did I not think it was important to know what to do next? It, it is vital for us to understand what it is we are to do and how we are to do it. And like I said, others can't do it for us. And a foolish person will think that someone else can or expect them to do it. The foolish always think that it is the job, it was the job of the more spiritual to handle those things. Those who, it's foolish to think I can go to church and let my pastor do all the work of 
of speaking the gospel, thinking that by osmosis, that was going to change me. I have to take what has been given to me and I have to use it. Uh, even the, the command in the garden to be fruitful and multiply means there's something I need to do. It is not simply that he provided the seed and let the garden be overgrown. Adam had a work, a job to do, a work to do. He had dominion over it. He had authority over it, but there was a work to do. I have salvation. I have dominion in my life because of salvation, but there is still something that he wants me to do. He wants me to be prepared. He wants me to know he's coming back and there's something I need to do to be ready for him. I must remain in him. I must stay in that continual state of expectation that he's coming. I can't turn loose of that. If I turn loose that he's coming, I'll be like those who go and uh, Jesus told other parables about um, he had a field and he put workers in the field. And then he, as the master, went away. And when it was time to receive his crop, sent people into uh, to represent him to go and receive some of that and take it to him. And those who worked in the field beat him up. So they didn't even they didn't even care that it wasn't theirs. They 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 took what had been given to them and, and took such ownership of it that they could do with it what they wanted. They didn't recognize that it still belonged to the master. Our salvation is because of Jesus. It's what he purchased on the cross for us. I don't get to heaven because of my works. I don't even get to heaven because I have worked in his name worked in a church, um, did things in his name, it will be that my heart was continually looking for his return, waiting to hear his voice and say, I'm ready for you. I've done what you've asked me to do. I have prepared myself and I have made myself ready. James 1, 22 to 25 says, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. This is where I think the foolish fell into this category. They, they heard the word, they knew that the bridegroom was coming, but they did nothing about it. They didn't prepare, they didn't have the oil. It was foolish behavior to act that way. And we have got to be the same. We've got to be those who are doers of the word, not hearers only. Everyone, must buy the oil for themselves. It will cost you individually and it is purchased personally. And we must choose to walk away from an old life and follow Jesus in his way, the way he expects us to, not in the way that we choose, not to do with what we think is best. We ask him, it's his way. Salvation was given to us. It's the way he made for us. It's his way. It's not my way, it's his way. In Luke uh, chapter 9, verses 57 to 62, Jesus says this. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Foolish people always have an excuse. Foolish people always have an excuse. We can't be those who begin and say, I will follow you. We've put our hand to the plow, but then we turn back. This is the story of Lot and his wife. She had to turn back and look at the old life. She still wanted the old life, what was behind her. And she was turned to a pillar of salt. She never reached her freedom. She didn't get to where she was supposed to go because she was continually looking back. It isn't enough to say, I will follow you, Lord. 
but I need to handle things first. I've got something I've got to do first. People like that always think they have another day, that tomorrow they'll do it. They think that they know and have control of their tomorrows and foolishly don't prepare for those very tomorrows the way that they should. Luke 14 verses 15 to 23 says this, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But then all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another foolish excuse. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Another foolish excuse. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Another foolish excuse. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys and towns and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but still there is room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Here, those virgins were supposed to be ready for the call. They were the invited, but they weren't ready and the door was closed. Much like the story of Noah. They watched for a hundred years as that man basically preached the word of God by saying, this is what God is saying and building a boat and an ark of safety and none would come in at his beckoning. And God sealed that door. And when the rain began to come down, it was too late. No one else could enter the ark. Jesus goes on to say in that same passage, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turned and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, and by the word hate, he means chooses over following him, that you put them above, does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their own cross, it's personal, and follow me, cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it, making preparation? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. We must remain. John 15 verses 4 through 11 says, remain in me as also I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. John 8, 31 says, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if 
you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. We must self-examine. We must stay in the way that he has prepared for us. We must keep our lights burning and have prepared with oil, expecting him to return at any moment, even if he tarries. We've got to get our own lives right. So today, if you have not made that decision to follow Jesus Christ, I urge you, there is a heaven and there is a hell. And it is up to you to decide where you will spend that eternity. Christ has already made the way. He's already died on a cross, taking our sins upon him, giving us his own blood to wash us and cleanse us and to make us pure and righteous in his sight. If you will, just ask him to forgive you of your sin, wash you and give you a brand new start where you can walk away from that old man and never look back at yesterday, but focus and prepare on your tomorrow because your tomorrow is not just today. Your tomorrow is what comes after this life and we've got to be ready. Thank you so much for joining me today. I pray that this was a blessing to you. If you would do me a favor, just like and be notified, share, subscribe. That would be a great help to me on this podcast as we're getting the word out and letting people know that Jesus loves them and there is hope for their tomorrow. God bless you. We'll see you next week.